Um, this is our uh, final uh, plenary, um, uh, or rather, uh, Tim Morton is our final uh, plenary speaker uh, today. Uh, it's a, a great honor to uh, introduce him. Um, Tim's uh, two most recent books have been recognized as groundbreaking works uh, in the field of eco-criticism, uh, Ecology Without Nature from 2007, uh, and its prequel, The Ecological Thought, which uh, came out from uh, in 2010, both with uh, Harvard University Press. Uh, Tim's works uh, challenge our long-held habits of thinking uh, about uh, the environment, nature, uh, and the human, revealing how these concepts derive from uh, a persistent belief uh, in an extra-social dimension that historical conditions, uh, especially our technological advancement, um, have rendered untenable. As Tim points out, the idea of the environment emerges only at the point at which it has become a problem. Um, but it is not only in his uh, bracing and insightful assessments of environmental concern, or our lack thereof, uh, that, is most dis uh, that is the most distinctive aspect of Tim's practice of eco-criticism. Rather, with the idea of eco-mimesis, uh, the poetics of ambiance, uh, Tim creates a capacious uh, theoretical concept that not only widens the scope of eco-critical attention from pastoral poetry and nature writing to encompass the performances of John Cage, surrealist automatic writing, or the horror classic The Thing, um, but it also engages with the concepts of uh, post-structuralist theory in a way that succeeds in revitalizing them and, dare I say it, re-enchants them. The conventional measures uh, used to assess the value of a scholar's work might include awards from, pro from professional organizations, book sales, and downloads of articles. I think there's a truer measure than these, and that is the capacity of a work to provoke enthusiastic and thoughtful discussion in a seminar on literary theory at the very end of the semester, <laughs> when fatigue and stress conspire against careful reading and lively engagement. It is impressive when a work of literary scholarship can arouse such a high level of passion and, and enthusiasm, and it is thus a delight to have Tim share with us his recent research at our conference on the non-human turn. So please join me in welcoming Tim Morton. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. That's so, that's so nice of you, wow, it's amazingly nice of you. Um, so thank you, everybody. I'm so happy to see you here. Um, many people I know, many people I don't know, and... Um, Let's just uh, start doing this. I'd, I'd like to thank um, Kerry Wolf and Alison Hunter for um, helping me with this. Now, before she became famous with Hey Mickey, before she was asked by an enthusiastic David Byrne to direct the video for Talking Heads is Once in a Lifetime, Tony Basil directed this. Volume up. Mr. Tech Guy, volume up, please. Volume up, please, yeah. Well, Great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay. A classic moment of video history. So I'm going to show you how this video in the song is the national anthem of uh, global anxiety, or rather the non-national anthem of anxiety, the overwhelming sensation that underlies ecological thinking, like a note that no one wants to hear, a certain high-frequency hum, like the sound of a malfunctioning electric pylon. This is the sound of the end of the world, but also of the beginning of history, the stone that the eco-philosophy builders cast away, the broken tool, the one golden key to the fact of coexistence with non-humans, the attunement of anxiety, our home base, or rather our unhome, uncanny, unheimlich. Tony Basil used the electric boogaloos, a stunning group of body poppers from Fresno and Long Beach. Byrne paid between 10 and 15 grand out of his pocket for it. Timothy Poppin, Pete, Solomon, Robert Dane, Skeeter Rabbit, Mook Twig, that is Twig Imai, the guy with the cigar, Scarecrow Scally Allen, Anna Marie Lollipop, Sanchez, body popping, locking, people becoming robots, becoming people. The first ever moonwalk on video is here, not Michael Jackson at the MTV Awards. He learned it from Twig, Imai, and uh, Skeeter, bouncing a basketball, tuning to the heft of the ball that asked to be bounced just that way. Humans tuning to industry, wearing masks, acting like machines. Black people trying to tune to the racist world, trying to fit, trying to act casual, feeling like an accident, moving to the rhythm of banking and high finance, working in a factory, making money trying to love, flooded with anxiety and fear, objectified. They are carrying a message. An overwhelming environmental threat hangs over these African Americans. One in Buddhism is called all-pervasive pain. Not just the pain of being stabbed or of not getting the money that you wanted by trying to sell those drugs, but what one teacher calls um, from Tibet an environmental creepiness. An overhanging sense of dread, what Levinas calls the Ilya, the there is, or what this song calls the there was. There was a knife, there was a formula, the beginning of a story, once upon the time there was. But what, you see, we don't know yet, we can only work by hindsight. It seems to come from everywhere. The dancers are suspended in white space, as if nothing means enough, or anything anymore. Then all of a sudden they are in their world, their Bronx life world, their Fresno life world, then back to white. The rug keep be keeps being pulled out. Surrounded they are, literally, by whiteness. A void that marks a deeper claustrophobia. A room. We discern it in the tight shadows around the dancers, the square shape of the video frame. A claustrophobic space of whiteness. A waiting room within nothing in it, with no exit, nothing around it. Funk. A broken blues without a story, without that four chord trick, that 12 bar narrative just popping in and out, locking into that first section like a needle stuck in the groove of a broken record. Repetition compulsion, returning again and again to the same part of the city like Freud in his essay on the uncanny, over and over again to the same strange part of town, the part that is your home, made stranger by the constant popping dislocation of the groove. That initial moment, the beginning of the blues, the basic unhappiness, that spawns the ironic enjoyment, the blue note, that chorus-like section that tries to fly from the sickering lurch of the verse and seems for a few seconds to float above it before descending back to uncanny home base, like a bird with a broken wing. No escape velocity can be achieved from the horrible gravity of this song, the centripetal talk emitted by the sharp and shortened blues on heavy rotation. Working by hindsight, getting the message from the oxygen of a, of a poisoned warming earth, I argue that what seemed in 1980 like postmodern free play, facts all come with points of view, turns out to be the disturbing truth of Lacan, that there is no meta-language realized in the age of ecology, formerly known as postmodernism, which was just the flashing neon sign on the tip of the iceberg. Irony becomes the food of phenomenological sincerity, the viscosity with which non-humans stick to us, live in our DNA, are our DNA, because as that other great 80s phenomenologist, Bakaru Banzai puts it, wherever you go, there you are. Blues for a blue planet with no exit. The lyrics, clownish, spiked, ironic, spiked with a faint message that becomes louder like radio interference you keep hearing at the back of the station you are tuned to, lost my shape, trying to act casual. Fair enough, that's funny and ironic, but then can't stop. I might end up in the hospital. I pushed the facts in front of me. There was a knife. 
There was a formula. The caesuras in each line allow for a twist of anxiety, uncertainty. They cause a kind of epistemological gap that might be hiding an ontological gap. Is that a void or is that obscuring something? That island of doubt is like the taste of medicine, the knife, the device that makes the cut. Facts cut a hole in us. Something keeps on going, seeping through the gaps torn by the hood's knife. The world is torn open, but there is no beyond. Just another being, walking with a knife, a sexy girl, a compelling memory, the promise of wealth, a lonely street, a suit, the smell of money, a dust mask, a briefcase, a rear windshield, an umbrella, a newspaper, a car. Yes, that car, covered with a sheet. The young man doesn't notice it as he shuffles up the street, doesn't notice it as it becomes iridescent blue, green, yellow, orange, red, magenta. That car, a tool, waiting for its user, an object, not waiting for anything, a horrible rainbow that no one sees, a rainbow not as a sign of a promise, but of a threat, an existential threat. There was a knife, there was a formula, Ilya as Livinos puts it. The rainbow connection, all right, but a rainbow connection between things, not a bridge to the beyond. Something is already here. They are here. An apocalypse of car. car apocalypse now. The essence of the car, unveiled for a second by the metaphorical fusion reaction of the video. The hidden withdrawnness of the car, ontologically beneath its tool being. Its hiddenness on display, hiding in plain sight. You want to shout at that kid, look at the car, dude! Look at the fucking car! <laughs> but you are on the hither side of the screen, and he is on the yonder side. Yet! For a second, it is as if this fourth wall dissolves as we glimpse tools whose operation was withdrawn throughout the video. The chroma keying, colour separation overlays, the BBC term, the use of a broken video camera and unusual colour control, Brian Eno's fingers turning the knob so the car is a not car, the, 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 so that the car that is a not car becomes the demonic rainbow car apocalypse in sickening nowness of indeterminate dimension. The kid's story is not over, is it? The car glows knowingly to no one. The fourth wall shattered, the video over. We have participated in a Dionysian ritual of coexistence, which is just what everyday tra every tragedy really is. It's over for us, but not for the car, or that kid, or that street, or that song that fades rather than ending. Black people, from the standpoint of racism, from the standpoint of environmental racism, tools with souls, Aristotle's definition of a slave, or Ganon Emsukon, living next to the garbage, working under the overpass, the littered railway tracks, looking at normal life through the windshield of someone else's car, thrust up against the chatter of the foreign languages of non-humans, the mystery and melancholy of a street, as De Chirico puts it, the melancholic uncanny of a world made of broken or uncared for objects, a parked car, perhaps abandoned, covered with cloth, the difficulty of doing anything, paralysed by the inertia of things, unable to cut through it with a knife of big business, stuck in the garbage, trying to push the facts in front of me, haunted by illusion, lies, anxiety, the story of race, the story of environment, the story of things all intertwined. What is happening? What is happening to the world? To ask Heidegger's founding question, perhaps at the right moment, is it right? It's called it something. How on earth does it stand with being? What we are seeing in that car shot is the camera as it talks to the sky. An early 1980s conversation between a broken tool, a burned out tube in a Panasonic colour video camera and a colour control knob, a knob not present on contemporary video cameras at all. A car shaped mat and a chroma key set up via a vision mixer, probably the Grass Valley or CMX non linear video editor. The whole scene filmed again to superimpose the shifting car shaped colour, cut with a knife, reshot with the chroma key formula. Chroma keying exploits how an object need not be present, it can be zuhanden, ready to hand, rather than vorhanden, present at hand. The car is replaced by a blue car-shaped map that becomes transparent when fed through a vision mixer set up to key out that precise luminance of blue. In another shot, Skeeter wears a blue face mask that is simply similarly keyed out to allow the overlaying of the smoking factory. The blue screen, nowadays because of digital sensors, the green screen, disappears. It is a beautiful example of a Heideggerian tool, since it's before your very eyes, right in front of the camera, yet it becomes transparent. 
allowing for different backgrounds to be placed behind the subject, in this case the electric boogaloos and the car. Transparent for whom? Not for a human directly, but for the camera itself, the camera that is composing the video image out of Skeeter Rabbit, popping and locking down the street, and the glowing colours that have become chroma keyed and into the outline of the car cover. With its blue colour channel keyed out via that luminance key in the vision mixture that matches the brightness of that particular chosen shade of blue, one tool, the camera, makes another tool, the screen or mat, invisible. We are like Hume, and unlike him, indirectly seeing a missing shade of blue. No wonder the video is so uncanny, a perfect complement to the song. The equipment itself creates a complex dance between visibility and invisibility, presence and absence, transparency and opacity, surroundings as tools that glint into presence like fish in a dark ocean and vanish. There was a knife, a cut, a cesura, a break, the intrusion of a non-human from outside the narrative frame, the intrusion of a technology outside the technological frame that guides the narrative, the intrusion, possibly, of another work of art altogether, a thin slice of something like Brian Eno's 1980 Mistaken Memories of Medieval Manhattan, for it may well be Eno's broken camera that causes this astonishing smooth blend from blue to pink, or at any rate, Burns and Basil's homage to this broken tool, Eno being the producer of Talking Heads' Remain in Light, the album that contains this track, and the author of this work, also 1980, as with his ambient music experiments, which emerged from a broken record player, that wouldn't, oops, that emerged from a broken record player that wouldn't increase its volume. Mistaken Memories plays with a broken camera left on its side in floods of Manhattan light. Eno's video piece is a view of Manhattan sideways on. A broken, non-human Manhattan inhabited by light and camera tubes, foster screens and building surfaces. For, this pres for his presentation in my graduate OOO class right now, Kevin O'Connor, one of my PhD students from performance studies, will turn all the tables and chairs. He's threatened to do this. He hasn't done it yet will turn all the chairs and tables on their sides and sit or rather lie on one of the chairs as we all enter the room. An anamorphic view of the same space that lost its shape, rotated away from habitual human grasping and use. What we see in the car and in the chroma keyed outlines of the humans that change colour is a conversation between photons and the electron stream from the gun in the video camera tube, undoubtedly a, video con a, a vidicon tube. The photoconducting surface at the front of the tube, probably made of selenium is activated by photons incident upon it. This surface is then scanned by an electron gun. What happens when we view the picture is a conversation between the classical physical level on which the photons high um, hit the photoresistant surface behind the camera lens and the quantum level that determines the picture which involves the phosphor screen to which the camera is hooked up or the TV screen that displays the final video. Why is this important for us today? Because it shows how depth complexity and manifold non-human levels of the assemblage light car, skeeter, rabbit, street, lens, photoconducting, screen, electron spray, electron gun, coaxial cable, electron gun, electron spray, phosphor screen, David Byrne, Brian Eno, Tony, Basil, viewer. I think I got it all. <laughs> That's an object, by the way. The weird distances and ambiguities involved, the strange accidents, the history that is wiped when we just think it's a video of cross-eyed and painless with some special effects. Not simply a history for us, but rather a shoal of sparkling, sensual objects. The phenomenological fish that Husserl discovered, but which uh, OOO applies to any interaction between any entities whatsoever. In brief, Husserl discovered that the vast ocean of reason that Kant had opened up, the third dimension of thought, as it were, was teeming with all kinds of phenomena such as hoping, wishing, asserting, love, hate, judging. These intentional objects are like fish swimming in the ocean, consisting of both a mind and its imminent object locked together as if with a coaxial cable. In the same way we could see the chroma key car cover and Skeeter with his factory displaying mask on and Anna Marie Sanchez lying sideways below Skeeter as he moon moon moonwalks across the museum steps as phenomenological fish in the sensual interspace between video camera, vision mixer and monitor. Thoughts in a kludge-like assemblage mind, not so different from the kludge that is the human brain, made of all kinds of primate, reptile, fish and sponge components. These quasi-thoughts are what the song calls facts. Somehow the video restores to the term fact the notion of making and crafting from the Latin facere, the birth and death of shoals of fact fish. And the cathode ray tube, the electron stream, 
is made of quanta, namely objects or units of a certain kind that excite electrons in the phosphor, another kind of unit. To do this, they must deflect, smack into, penetrate. At this level, the quantum level, seeing and measuring are haptic. To perceive at this level means to hit with another quantum. Thus, at this level, there is no difference between seeing a bemused philosopher, seeing, billi seeing this billiard ball and that billiard ball, smacking another one, um, and the billiard ball smacking the, each other. It, isn't si it simply isn't possible to see before the smack. This gives rise to complementarity, the deep reason for Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and the Schrodinger equations. To see is to change. The quantum is withdrawn before, but does it even make sense to speak of linear time here? It is measured, working by hindsight. The camera tube is already damaged before it is considered damaged by a human. A photon hits the photoresistant screen. A jump in energy causes an electron and its whole partner to be released into the conductor. Band. Many times this happens and the pattern is now detectable by the stream from the electron gun. Watching the subsequent video image, we are also watching a record of accidents. In a cathode ray tube, the crystal lattices of the phosphor screen contain little impurities. It's nothing other than the record of abandoned object cathexes, as Freud says, of the human ego. In this case, the trace chemicals or dopants that treated the lattice to make it non-homogeneous and prolong the emission time, that is technically the afterglow. The camera's tube sees by being damaged. Each registration of the electron gun is like a little death and the simultaneous birth of something new, a fresh electron liberated from its place in the crystal lattice. The liberation creates a little hole, which gives rise to an electronic level in what is poetically called the forbidden gap. The electron in the hole, known collectively as, as an exciton, floats about until it finds lum, uh, equilibrium again by slotting into an impurity center. It gives up energy as luminescence, de-exciting swiftly by scintillation and de-exciting slowly by what is known also poetically, slowly meaning in milliseconds, as the forbidden mechanism. Forbidden because it's improbable that such scintillation could happen except under excited conditions and rarely even then. But like the forbidden city, they still exist. Forbidden colours. The fragile, impossible, hallucinatory video image, produced in part by fleeting and improbable forbidden mechanisms. A fragile quantum magic that could easily be fried away to classical nothing by too many electrons incident on that crystal on that crystal lattice. This is not a digital, or to use another metaphor, black and white, haha, situation. It's analog. The forbidden gap and the forbidden mechanism are not totally out of bounds, just hard to access. What does this tell us? That there are regions in objects such as crystal lattices that are opaque. They are obscure, not totally non-existent. The gap is a symptom of a deeper entity withdrawn from access. Otherwise, absolutely nothing could happen across it because it isn't even nothing. It's an ukontic nothing. The gap is a meontic nothing, a nothingness, a thingly nothing. This idea of a nothing that is of the mask of a something, not the total absence of anything at all, but uh, will become very significant as we proceed. We humans see a dot of colour. That is, we see a mistake. The memory of a mistake, the trace of scintillation, a mistaken memory. Memory as a mistake, as broken tool, the record of accidents, as Freud says, all the shocks that things are heir to. A crystal lattice that lost its shape, deformed into new form. We see the colourful display of an instability that has been cancelled, working by hindsight. We see the past the afterglow, but at the quantum level what has taken place is a little drama of life and death. If for a moment I can indulge in what Jane Bennett has happily called a kind of strategic anthropomorphism. Or is it? I mean Freud breaks the death drive down to a single-celled organism, but why stop there? DNA is evidently an unstable molecule that is trying to get rid of itself, accidentally and ironically reproducing itself as soon as it unzips. And why even stop there? DNA needs ribosomes, which need DNA. So to break the vicious circle, there must have been an RNA world of RNA replicants hitched onto non-organic replicants, perhaps silicate crystals. Are we at the level of life here or beyond it? It's just a small metaphysically, is life just a small metaphysically dubious region of a much larger undead region, neither living nor dead? And why stop at replicants such as RNA or those silicates? I mean, how come molecules can replicate at all? Is there not some dance between stability and instability that is deeper still? Aha. Come on, page 16. Get back in place. 
When too many photons hit the photoconducting surface in the tube, say like Eno, you had left your newly acquired tool, he got it from this guy in Foreigner, your newly acquired tool lying on its side in a window in the full Manhattan sunshine, the tube burns out. The death of a thing is its successful translation, success never being absolute in this object-oriented world, but good enough to alter, that is to damage the thing in question. A photon or an electron shocks a crystal lattice into life, life meaning inconsistency, that is the constant search for death. That is consistency, the disequilibrium of a crystal lattice flooded with its own excited electrons that flow about until they find their resting place, sparks of colour as death. We see the story of a crystal lattice shocked into releasing photons of certain frequencies, defined packets, units, quanta. We see traces of the shock in the gorgeous disturbing colour. We see the past, just as we can't directly see death only memories, pieces of paper in a wastebasket, some car keys, so the death happening in the tube can't be seen directly. The electron from the gun dies, liberating the electron from the lattice, a lattice of yttrium oxide sulfate, the red channel, zinc sulfide, sulfide and copper, the green channel, on zinc sulfide with a few parts per million of silver, the blue channel, or rather, a gigantic assemblage of lattices, gigantic at least from an electron's or photon's point of view, a veritable hyperobject for them. Placing our eyes near the monitor, we humans see the trace of death in the video image. But there is also death at the quantum scale. Appearance is the trace of death, namely the form of a thing, which just is the past. Form is the past. The withdrawn essence of the thing, on the other hand, can't be located in measurable, ontically given space. Not for us humans, not for the electron, not for the photon. This before is really a not yet, the future that lies in wait inside the camera tube. The essence of the tube is the future. Its appearance as burned out electrons is the past. When too much past accumulates, the whole tube is burned out, which is to say that it crosses a certain threshold, but the threshold, like human death, is not thin or rigid. Still, the tube records colour, colours that are in fact quite lovely. It is truly a mistaken memory, as Eno's title of his own piece makes clear, the memory trace of electrons liberated from a crystal lattice by too many incident photons. The tube is ruined from a human point of view, and from the standpoint of commodity circulation. You can't put it on eBay or in those far-off days in the classified section. But it's still operational, agential, doing its thing. From the human point of view, it's a zombie, an undead being that scoffs at the rigid boundary between death and life, an alien being from an alien world. And thanks to Ian for this metaphor. An alien world just behind the video itself just to the side of Skeeter Rabbit, just to the side of the street, not located in some beyond, but right here, or rather making here far stranger than a regularly shaped atom of time, undermining, in fact, the temporal atomism that underwrites the metaphysics of presence, not by evaporating things into a flux, but by staging the intrusion of an alien being into a seemingly coherent world, or rather, the always already presence of an object, a non-human, that car, that video tube, that Manhattan sky, aliens in our midst, as Ian puts it, we are in their, mid we are in their midst. Whose midst is it anyway? This is not my beautiful car. Lost my shape. I feel like an accident. Causality. How something begins as an accident, as anamorphosis, as distortion, irreducibly. An excitation in a crystal lattice. A cut made by a knife or a photon. A gap in the reel that is then seen as a tear through which light comes. A blob that used to be a car that was always already a blob of colour. A distortion of metal, plastic, oil and drivers. Oil, an anamorphic distortion of algae and dinosaur bones. We can only see it backwards, working by hindsight, reading clues, getting messages, getting the message from the oxygen. As if we were able to think the conditions of the possibility of that video working by hindsight. Kant's discovery of a vast hidden realm of transcendental space and time within, behind the back of, thought. And then Husserl's discovery that this realm is not a cold, empty realm of purity, but is teeming with phenomenological fish, which we have equated with the phenomena seen not by humans, but by the inter-objective assemblage of video camera and vision mixer and monitor. Beneath this ocean of flashing fish moves the silent, horror-struck U-boat of Heideggerian Dasein through the cold darkness and opacity of angst. And yet, 
In a further twist, it is as if travelling in a bathysphere released from the U-boat, far, far beneath that gigantic ocean of a priori synthesis and intentional or sensual objects, we are invited by the video to detect an amazing coral reef of actually existing beings. Already there, a Panasonic PK600 video camera, a burnt-out tube, the sky, someone's fingers on the colour controls, a CMX600 non-linear video editor, video manually sliced by rulers are facts about photons translating electrons, traces of the past, stories inscribed in phosphor, an illusion-like trail of facts scintillates, a trail that fades over time. Facts are the shadows of things, their echo thrown into the past from an impossible futurality. Facts are nothing on the face of things. What a perfect OOO insight. Facts, the factical, facticity, are on the side of illusion and shadow play precisely because there are real things, real things that they don't touch. Underneath the burn and eno postmodern frisson of unmeaning, there are entities. Facts are nothing on the face of them. Facts are useful, however, in emergencies. I hear. <laughs> the current ecological emergency confronts us with the non-metaphysical intimacy of non-human beings. An emergency in which we grab for facts, but they might be broken, they might be lying, and furthermore, they are nothing on the face of things. They are a way not to see the face of things. They may be useful, but facts don't exhaust the emergency that just is the existence and coexistence of things. The line is sung with a half-knowingness, as if the narrator was double, triple-checking his pocket for keys and wallet obsessively, compulsively, to stave off anxiety, the sharp end of coexistence, the abyss of wishful thinking, a rope bridge suspended over the abyss of anxiety. A non-human panic sets in. Lifting my head, looking for the danger signs. Fear, my favourite emotional state, says Windermere. As if acknowledging this, Byrne amended the line of the 1984 live show Stop Making Sense to facts are useless in emergencies. Now that's more like it. Facts don't stain the furniture, yet facts go out and slam the door, and they lie, they twist the truth around. Or are they telling the truth? Between the flattened seventh and the tonic note of the funk sequence, there is nothing, not even nothing, an ukontic nothing, like a forbidden gap between electron levels which an electron jumps across when excited by a photon in the crystal lattice on a phosphor screen. It is as if we are being shown two sides of the same thing, over and over, or are those the same side of two different things? Isn't it weird? Looks too unsure to me. Whose Mobius strip is this anyway? Why are we in this muddle? Because of things, because of non-humans. Below the depths traversed by the Heideggerian U-boat, there is a gigantic coral reef of beings, anxiety, dasein, being. They all depend on the always already of these sparkling beings bouncing up and down like balls or David Byrne. Beneath facticity, that is, beneath the correlationist being in the world that is the primordial facticity, there are things. Facticity itself is nothing on the face of things. I am still waiting. 1790 was the age in which Western philosophy decided that it could only talk about access to reality, not reality as such. It was also the beginning of the Anthropocene, the moment at which human history intersects with geological time, because human beings begin to deposit a thin layer of carbon in Earth's crust, which can now be found in deep lakes and Arctic ice. In 1945 came the great acceleration, a vast increase in the magnitude of the Anthropocene marked by the deposition of a thin layer of radioactive materials in Earth's crust, courtesy of the gadget, little boy and fat man. The basic attunement of the Anthropocene is anxiety, which is precisely the feeling of the loss of world, the end of the world, but not as we thought a great bang or a void, but a prolongation of things in synchrony with the disappearance of a meaningful backdrop, and thus the disappearance of the foreground as such. The island of doubt is like the taste of medicine, a totally white background, blank, white, a meontic nothing. Nothing has enough meaning. A horrible familiarity and strangeness of anxiety. It's uncanny creepiness that seems to lurk just off the edge of our perception, like a car in a driveway beside the street you're walking on, or a car approaching in your wing mirror. Your wing mirror, being an object-oriented ontologist, says, objects in mirror 
are closer than they appear. That's the trouble with ecology. It brings everything too close. Things become vivid yet unreal at the very same time and for the very same reasons. Underneath nihilism, not in spite of it, but through it, Downwards, there are things. The postmodern hesitation and luxuriance in the slide of signification is a soothing elixir that blocks access to these beings that exist underneath nihilism. The island of doubt, a soothing oasis in the ocean of anxiety, nihilism itself is a thicker version of this island of doubt, like a layer of seaweed that covers over the iridescent, painfully sharp beings that sparkle beneath the U-boat of Heidegger. I'm still waiting. The feeling of beginning, what is called in narrative aperture, the sense of an opening. Is it, it is this sense of beginning which just is the pure givenness that underscores the Kantian aesthetic dimension that Talking Heads' video exemplifies. The car winks at us slightly provocatively. It is the one that is still waiting, not just human me, not just the narrator or Skeeter Rabbit, in order to have attunement, the Stimmung of beauty, the perfect experience of one's unconditional abyss of reason, the frightening fact that we can indeed think beyond the human, beyond Herman Minkowski's light cone, we can think 30 million years ago, we can think the Oort cloud at the edge of the solar system, we can think events that cannot be located in space-time anywhere at all, events that actually exist. In order for all this, there is already, always already, an entity, a being, an object. Not some vague whatever being, but a specific, unique being. As if the Levinasian Ilya were an actual schizophrenic homeless guy sitting at the entrance to the church, this is basically the mise-en-scene of Coleridge's rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. The proximity of an alien presence underwrites the nihilistic abyss of reason, the Kant, um, plung into which Kant plunges thinking, the third dimension of inner space that opens at the very beginning of the Anthropocene, the TARDIS-like infinity within, because I can know infinity, because I know I can't count to it, which is precisely what infinity is. Just as Kitsch, which is the aesthetic shit of the other, underwrites beauty, since in order to experience it, beauty must, um, beauty must be um, uh, distinguished from it. Kant argues, therefore universalizable, that is, everyone should find this painting beautiful, but I shan't coerce you into your finding it so. Thus, someone else's beautiful thing might just be your shit. The ugly and slimy and crappy, a shiny frosted Christmas ornament, a thing banished to the hinterlands of taste because it is precisely a thing. The unconditional, non-coercive givenness of beauty, which just is a projection of my reason, is predicated on the a priori synthetic judgment, the third dimension beyond uh, scholastic being, that Kant opens up. That icy region of the mind's Antarctic, analogous to the nihilistic probings of earthly space of the quasi-imperialist ancient mariner himself. Yet this profoundly non-violent being with the beautiful thing is predicated on that thing's existence, which threatens me beneath the abyss of reason with a horrifying, uncanny agency. The car winks at me knowingly. The aesthetic sheen, German shine, of beauty is undergirded by the glistening uncanny that opens up in the chameleon shifting of the car. It is like watching a shaft of sunlight from another world illuminate that car, another world just behind your head, just next to the apparatus that produces the video, the other world that is precisely Brian Eno's camera gear, his broken tools, sitting just to the left, just off screen, an alien world that is utterly intimate with this one, casting its strange light on it from a few inches away. Is this not more scary than the Kantian depths of inner space, more creepy even than the death of distant stars that we can detect if we push the radio telescope of speculative realism through the Kantian correlationist bubble? Because this thing here, this TV image, is winking at me, sending out a sonar pulse from underneath nihilism, not in spite of it, but through the abyss of reason, through the darkness, as if to say, sure, the silence and stillness of these infinite spaces fills you with Pascalian dread, baby, but only because that silence and stillness are the sound of my breathing down your neck, two inches away from the back of your head. Like one that on a lonesome road doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round walks on and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. Coleridge figured it out. At the very beginning of the Anthropocene, poetry is sometimes a way to do philosophy when you lack the thoughts. Inside the beauty is the a priori. 
Inside the a priori is the given. Inside the given is the thing, whatever you want to call it, this object. Um, this object, this actual cut-out piece of chroma keyed video space, this space that is actually a substance, an oozing of photons and videotape. Ecological awareness then, far from being the happy, happy, joy, joy world of we are all earthlings. Sorry, Muppet Show. It's the uncanny nightmare charnel ground realm where nothing is exactly, ontically, precisely real and all the more real for that. The demonic quality of art, always disturbing to the philosopher who rightly wards off the aesthetic dimension as a domain of evil. Because in order to be beautiful, art, an object, has already hypnotized us. We are always already caught in the spooky agency, the shine of the headlights of the non-human that has us under its spell. The very infinitude of reason's abyss, our capacity not simply to understand but to think, is suspended in the demonic interspace between things, a dream time that pulses with evil light. Why evil? Because we can't tell whether it's lying or not. What constitutes pretense is that, in the end, you don't know whether it's pretense or not, Lacan. Far from giving us a boring world of billiard balls that clunk in predictable dull ways, OOO gives us this world, a spooky world plagued with beings who may not be alive, who may not be intelligent. Are we one of them? A kind of sort of world of good enough performativity precisely because objects are real, not because they aren't. A world of always incomplete Turing test data because each thing is hidden in a cosmological version of Turing set up behind the door of withdrawal, sending us sensual types about itself under the doorway, a claustrophobic world of slightly evil illusion. Good art, then, always threatens us from, the slightly, from this slightly evil place, and in so doing it is fully and meaningfully ecological, despite its content, because this evil is the mask worn by trickster objects as they pull us down underneath modernity's nihilism into a reanimist universe of lies, traps, demons and slapstick, not in spite of that nihilism, but underneath it, through it, out from under it, like Danny in The Shining. Because in the end, what is far more scary than absolutely nothing at all, the ookontic nothing, is the shifty, ghostly, meontic nothing of nothingness. The pretense you can't tell whether it's pretense or not. When Skeeter empties his pockets in one of the video's final scenes, it is as if he is pulling out this nothingness. He wants it to be ookontic. See, I got nothing. There is not even nothing here. Yet instead, his pockets rebel against his human intention as Skeeter pulls out his basic anxiety in the face of the cigar-chomping hustler with his tricksterish hand jive, as if instead to say, what do you want from me? Skeeter's very pants subvert his wish to enter properly the human social symbolic order, as if the video, like Ian Bogost was saying, um, you are looking for aliens in the wrong place. They are your pants pockets. They are in your pants pockets. They are under that car cover. They are that cover, hiding in plain sight, right here, under your nose, just behind you, a frightful fiend. In a dizzying perspective shift, it turns out that the abyss that we took to be an abyss of reason, or perhaps of swirling matter behind things, is actually in front of things. And not only this, the abyss is emitted by things, like radio waves. It is the abyss of causality, otherwise known as the aesthetic dimension. Givenness beyond the ontically given that I take to be real in a metaphysics of presence way. What is called nature just is the reduction of things to their givenness for humans. This reduction must be policed, since it is inherently spurious and unstable. Instead, we should look beyond nature, namely beyond the beyond, to the things right in front of us, hiding in plain sight. They are here, lifting my head, looking for danger signs, looking around inside, working by hindsight, got the message from the oxygen, ecological awareness, always belated, finding yourself inside something, inside a gigantic being called biosphere, an ocean of anxiety in which objects bob up and down in a menacing expressionist funk, halfway between clown and murderer acting as crime, art, as evil, a magician with a cigar and a stash of money, a hip-hop dancer distorted by machines, a basketball, a car, a knife, exhaust from a factory smoke start stack, facts lost, facts are never what they seem to be, me, an ocean of anxiety, dancing around you, another ocean of anxiety, do knives and basketballs experience anxiety, the one emotion that never lies, they distort 
They are distortion. The car, that car, a not car, that ocean of colour, they are here. The car is still waiting. Thank you very much. Yeah, my, my, my abbreviated version of this talk was simply to stand here and say, FIRE! <laughs> um, but I want to talk about, I want to talk about the effects that you're producing. And, and, mm. and I just want to ask you, what are you doing? What the? <laughs> have, you, have you considered the effect of your anxiety generation distribution machine? Yeah. And the reason why I ask that is um, because we, like Americans, Yes. North Americans have just gone through a concerted program of anxiety generation called the Global War on Terror. Yes. For the last 20, you know, Very America good point. And, and so there's a kind of, um, if I historicize what you're doing, I, 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 I worry yeah. that, that the reading of object oriented philosophy that you're, you're giving that centers on uh, anxiety um, is. Oh. Could be. Yeah. And then I'm thinking, um, because as you're as you're talking, I'm thinking to myself, but 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 why are these alien objects, these alien presences around us? Why do you think they provoke spookiness or anxiety? Because they're familiar in the mm -hmm. sense, like you know, like the other sense of familiar, like the yes. Sense. And then um, and also the uncanny. Yeah. Sure. Uh, the point of these, the uncanny is not horrifying. The uncanny is timeless and unhighness. Yeah. So I just wanted you to... Great. That's time. fantastic. What are you doing? Yeah. What, the what am I doing? Um, well, I'm very glad you asked me that question, Jane. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so the, the point is that, in a way, the war on terror was a way to cover up this anxiety that I'm talking about. Okay, just for a minute, right, from the point of view of my friend Le Le uh, Leke Adiaco, who was a Nigerian who is in Florida. He said, now people who live in America know what it's like to be bombed, right? So just for a minute, it was as if, oh my God, there's an outside, and that's occurring to me, you know, my mum-in-law, who's a native Colorado and who's never stepped foot outside the USA. Oh my God, there's an outside. It just flew into this building, right? There's an outside of this thing, right? That's the anxiety. OMG, my world is this fictional construct, and there are these things. Now, I think the war on terror, with its color-coded sort of rainbow of stupidity, is, is, is a way to cover that up, actually. Fear, right, is, so, so it's object, ba it's based on some object. What I'm talking about is a kind of unconditional, basic anxiety, right? The sort of thing that comes up in meditation. You know, it's a big problem with meditation from the point of view of Western people who want to chill, you know, is that a few minutes into it, you get the anxiety. Right, it's much better to run or do yoga, yeah, and then maybe meditate, you know, because um, it's, it, it really does seem to be in, in, intuitively the case that um, it is the default mode of existing. And I know this to be true because I'm selling my house right now. And when, and when, you're, when you're selling your house, you, you turn your house into a product, right? And you have to evacuate it, and then people study your house, and they go, I think that, this takes 17 days in California, I do not want <laughs> to buy. Get on with it, get on with it. You know, and, and, and just imagine someone in the third world, right, they, they, they have to take out a loan to buy like a, like a fridge. They, they, they're having this anxiety all the time, right? So in some way, that anxiety is actually connecting us, actually. It's the feeling of coexisting, why? Because, because inside the anxiety, this is just my own phenomenological experience, okay? Inside the anxiety is the depression, okay? And the, the melancholia. Now Freud says that melancholia is the, is the footprint of something else in your soul, as it were. It's the footprint of some other being, right? So you now have experiential evidence that there are others in your world because you've, been, you've got this object-like entity inside you, right? This is all like evidence that there really is a world out there, yeah? 
Now, the thing is that um, my, my, my kind of uncanniness, right, which you're very help, you see, help, you're, you're living in the future, right, because we, we, we're going towards some kind of animist view, I feel, or non-animist, reanimate, I don't know, whatever, but <laughs> indigenous style thinking about reality because of an ironic kind of closure of the system that we're in, because we're in this gigantic thing called biosphere. So the anxiety is just the feeling that we all have when, as we're exiting modernity. Like, I feel like Latour is incorrect, we have been modern, you know, and, and, and we can tell that we have been, because we can't, I can't talk to anyone about the weather anymore. Like, I go to the bus stop, you know, and like, oh, nice rain we're having, or is it global warming, or I can't even, I don't want to mention, someone else is going to mention it, is it, is it not, this wet stuff falling on my head, it isn't really global warming, it's a symptom of global warming, but maybe it is, maybe it isn't, so my world has dissolved, right, reality has appeared, right, but reality is a kind of trickster, like I'm trying to say, right, it's, it's, it's a kind of trickster thing, and we experience that in um, Western philosophical space as a kind of demonic evil, Right? And my job is to get people excited about evil. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm not feeling anxious at all. Good. Um, because I recognize the limited. Oh, good for you. For the humanities, in terms of thinking about knowledge transmission, I'm like, I'm actually about it. This is sometimes a unique experience. And so I guess mm. what I'm interested in is what is what is the machine that you've made here trying to do? The rhythm machine that you've mm -hmm. made here, the, the word yeah. mesh machine with right on. remixed images. What am I up to? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously. Yeah. Now I'm sort of on Oprah explaining. What I, yeah. <laughs> what the hell are you up to? Okay, well, I, with, with 2020 hindsight, I can tell you. Um, it's, it's a sort of homeopathic dose of the fear, unconditional fear, right? It's in, instead of trying to fight it, you see, lot, there's, there's lots of ecological philosophy that's all like, everything's interconnected and it's so great! You know, it, no, no, it isn't. My, my, my body's full of uranium, plutonium, mercury. The leg bone's connected to the toilet bone. The toilet bone's connected to the toxic waste dump bone. The toxic waste dump bone is connected to the Pacific Ocean bone. And we're in a hell of a mess and there's no outside of it, right? I, I, so all of a sudden my sort of cynicism, which is the default philosophical subject position, Right, of, of modernity has been defeated, not by me, but by other beings, right? I just can't exit reality, achieve escape velocity quickly enough, right? So my job, my very small part, you see this is the thing, they should put me in charge of the press conference, sorry to be arrogant, but, 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 but they, put, they, they put scientists, right, and they go, there is global warming, can't you see, you stupid fundamentalist numbskull, you know, and, and, and that comes across as a debate about belief, which in fact it is, because in a funny way, although the scientists are now going to tell me that I'm just as bad as those religion guys, right, um, holding on very, t they, they both share the same belief about belief, which is that belief is something that you hold on to very, very, very tightly, right? Now, the closest I came to having an effect in, in the political world was when Christopher de Freitas' wife, he's a global warming denialist scientist funded by Exxon, showed up at my talk, at one of my things in New Zealand, you know, and we were doing this dialogue, me and Douglas Kahn, and he was doing the sort of hopeful kind of ecological technology, everything's good, and I was sounding the kind of big bass drum of doom, you know, and it was working very well, but there was this aura in the air that she was going to say something, because she got, to, she made me so upset at, at dinner, like, can you really prove global warming's existing? Isn't this not important? This is not as important as giving people water and stuff. And so, how, how to get my mojo back, and I realised what I have to do, instead of trying to persuade people that it's real, I have to walk you through, because the whole problem is whether it's real or not, right? I have to be honest about the kind of weird unreality that we're all going through, and I have to walk you through a phenomenologically equivalent inner space experience, right? It doesn't matter what it's about, it's just going through the fear and realising, OMG, there are other beings, right? And if I can just do that, then maybe... Um, I set the conditions for, of possibility for, you know, whatever belief, you know, of, about global warming. You know, so my, my theory of what I'm doing, right, which is probably not what I'm actually doing, because the unconscious is real. I'm not talking about your unconscious, by the way. My one. You know, everyone else has an unconscious out there. We're all fully present to our thoughts, okay, except for me. But my, my fantasy about what I'm doing is that I'm giving you a homeopathic dose of this anxiety so you don't delete it. Right? Because it's that, that's the magic key, 
right? That, 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 that m m much politics and philosophy is trying to like d d disavow, get rid of, deny, right? And that's the magic key, actually, you know? And so you have to not have an allergic reaction to that, right? That, that's what I think I'm doing. Allergy medicine. My talk is allergy medicine. <laughs> Yes. And just very quickly, um, I saw some fabulous plan for it uh, in Los Angeles last night. Great. And I think slam poetry, you know, to the similar rhythm, yeah. has expressed that anxiety of sure. being out there, being present. Yeah. Think, yes. Really right on. Yeah, art is a way to think when thinking is hard. I mean, look at Jane Austen, right? She allows you to... Ex Why is Jane Austen so popular? It's not because it's about posh people holding teacups the right way, right? It's because it's about desperate people who mustn't look desperate, right? Because they're women in the lower gentry, yeah? And we... And our anxiety is triggered by this incredible technology that she invented, which is indirect, untagged speech, right? Kermit the Frog got out of bed and thought to himself, it's going to be a lovely day today. Right? That's tagged in direct speech. Kermit the Frog got out of bed. It was going to be a lovely day. Oh my God, is that the narrator? Is that Kermit the Frog? I don't know. Ah, and, in, and so your own anxiety locks onto the, and suddenly Kermit becomes three dimensional, right? So I feel like um, art is a way to walk us through th thinking that is difficult, you know, because of political circumstances, right? It's a way of doing philosophy by other means, right? It's, it's, it's often said about horror movies, right? But I think, you know, Jane Austen, The Muppet Show, Talking Heads, also could be that. Um, yes? Yeah, um, so you, you sort of start with Talking Heads as a, as a New York band, it seems like. Sure. Um, expressing that sort of image of you know, you know, that you're using, and you are turning with that. Yeah. And then move outwards to the global from that. I was wondering if you could yeah. talk a little bit about, say, My Life in the Bush of Ghosts, or sort of later, yeah. that's where they're dealing sort of explicitly with, with sort of more specifically global, you know, coming from outward in. You know, right. Um, Kerry Wolf's done interesting things on that, hasn't he? So, um, you know, the, this is a sketch, right? It's a hor hor horrible sketch. But for, for me, it, it would be part of this cut from the same cloth. There are already other beings, right? I mean, this, this use of um, Islamic... A uh, woman singing in that song Testament, right. right? It's already there in your radio space. They're not over here. They're not over there. Yonder and hither, and the, and, and, and the way that was kind of framed in you know the press and and by us was as a kind of postmodern pastiche of wow. But I'm saying that's actually like the the warning sign, like the little light in your correlationist aircraft goes off. Beep beep. Other beings exist. Beep beep beep. That's that's the the warning sign of that, right? And the reason why I, li I like it is because it, it, it's working with fear, you know, for some reason. Um, Aaron? Um, I think it's interesting that the word theme uh, is very close to sort of one letter short of the word friend. Um, and Sorry, the word what? Friend. The word friend? Yeah, well... Fiend and friend, yes, yes, fiend and friend. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, yeah. Objects can be themes, objects can be friends. They can sort of uh, switch back and forth between those two kind of uh, phenomenological, you know, uh, conditions. Right on. Uh, like these would be uh, our perception of them very quickly. So Ian um, needs to develop a software that can go on Facebook called Fiend. Right? right? You can fiend someone. <laughs> right? You can, right? Oh, nice. Okay, yeah. great. I'm happy about that. Yeah, I I'm supposed to scare people because it's dinner time. You know. Go away and have dinner. Somebody what else wanted to ask. Um, yes? So, uh, um, I also wondered what, what the heck you're doing, and I want to thank you for, for raising that question. Um, thank I like the performative and the, and the rhythmic part. It seemed that one thing you were doing was to just uh, somehow with a promo for uh, uh, certain ontology objects that are ontology. Sure. And I'm wondering... And Somebody has to uh, make it sexy, right? A whole lot of fear <laughs> that uh, oh, 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 who is, uh, will be just a moment or just a school like uh, the Khan and the Luz and so many wonderful, wonderful yeah. things. So I want okay. to ask the question that I raised to Mr. Hanson over here in mm. Madison 
last year, how do you, um, say, institutionalize this beyond a rather small set of yeah. hipster here in Lowe's? Yes. Here and around the right world. Right on. Um, yeah. So it's not just this, since it has... Started. Yeah. It's pretty it's resonant. Changes. I think it's pretty resonant. Uh, and I actually think that the performance may be part of it. Right on. Uh, yeah. I think basically, look, okay, so there's various ways. Now, um, one thing is, um, I thought the question was going to go, you are commodifying things and you are a bourgeois shit. So you didn't go there. Right, right, yeah. Um, so I'm quite happy about that right now. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, 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 what, but, but what, I think I'm, what I think I'm hearing is that um, there is a sort of uh, performative dimension to communication, right? I'm associating it with Padma Sambhava, who was a great yogi who brought Buddhism to Tibet. Now they tried, now he's, it's like bringing OOO, you know, to us lot, right? And they kept on destroying it. They, 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 they brought in these teachers who were like, emptiness is really, you know, you must understand everything is coexisting and everything's uh, interconnected and compassion and love and it's all great and then fuck you man, we shot them because they were all like cowboys, like Tibetan version of a cowboy culture and trying to introduce this really refined sort of Buddhism that had been around for a thousand years didn't work, right? So they brought in this hitman called Padma Sambhava, who was like a magician, you know, and I'm not arrogantly saying I'm like Padma Sambhava, that would be a gross sort of violation of my whatever, but sort of somehow we, we also need in the world a little bit of magic, right? How do we get, this is serious, this is a political question, how do we get millions of people to be as passionate about reality as we all are in this room, right? And the weirdness of it and the richness of complexity, however you want to think, right? No, well, but I think the point is, how, how do you do it? I think you need a little bit of magic, right? Because especially um, in this culture where people are so um, hesitant, right? I think, I think, I mean, I come from California right now, which is the capital of hesitancy in the world. You know, is this a, is this a conversation we're having? Is this a microphone? I can't quite, we just check, this is a light, yeah? And this is a ceiling and we're having a conversation. I need it to be verified, you know? I'm living in paradise, but I have to check, right? Um, now the thing is that in that situation you need a little bit of some kind of miracle, right? And um, I, I, I truly believe, you know, contrary to what was said a little bit earlier, object-oriented ontology is deeply congruent with Buddhism. You know, and Foucault argues that at some point Western philosophy has to connect to non-Western thinking, you know, despite the fact that this is not popular amongst the philosophical Buddhists who are all about, there is nothing, it's all just a justification of my very normal 20th century Western nihilism, you know, it's, it's that other kind of Buddhism where there is Buddha nature, there is enlightenment, but it's non-conceptual, you can't see it directly, but it exists, right? That's an object from an OOO point of view. Buddha nature is an object, right? So in, or, in order to get people to kind of tune to that, we need some kind of magic, you know, as well as good arguments, we need to do magic. And magic is a little bit scary, you know, especially if you think that, you know, what I'm supposed to do is do reasonable propositions that fit together. So, so, so the best would be, within logic, right, I'm not one of these people who thinks that, that logic is over there and what I'm doing is here. I actually think that within logic you can find very strange things that were discovered by, say, Cantor, and then kind of the door was shut on them by Zemelo Frankel, right? Um, things that are totally discrete and yet they contain one another, one another. There's the infinity of real numbers that's much bigger than the infinity of rational numbers, but they, one of them can seem to contain the other. And how come there's a, is there, or is there not a continuum, you know, between these things, or are they actually sort of weirdly discrete, like these OOO objects, right? These infinities, okay? And, and we're just saying, look, there's this infinity, there's this infinity, this infinity, this infinity, 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 right? Just like Cantor sort of saying, there's a, infinities are manifold and they're discrete, right? And, but you need some kind of magic to bust through. You need to take people's modernity and, and sort of push it. So I, I like to take them through the horror show, because we all like a bit of horror, right? Because we all think it's cooler than comedy or whatever. Yeah. Right. But that doesn't get rid of everything, does it? If everything is inter in, in, interconnected, it doesn't mean there's just one great lump of nothing. No, that's true. So, so, so the Zogchen, the, 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 the Zogchen, well, I'm, I'm afraid we have to beg to differ. There are no objects in this kind of measurable, ontically given way, right? But as the Zen guy says, there are mountains, and then there are not mountains, and then there are mountains, 
right? And the enlightenment is there are mountains, not there are no mountains, there is a mountain, right? It's not my concept of mountain, but it's, it's there, it's beyond concept, right? Um, and, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, that otherwise we could just do, from a Buddhist point of view, you, you could commit murder, right? Because there's no reason, because there's no such thing as reality. It's all an illusion, right? What I'm trying to say is it's like an illusion, which is much more scary, right? This is more of an indigenous culture view, right? Reality is like an illusion. If I know it's an illusion, then it's not really an illusion, because I'm safe. Because at least I know that, right? I'm a Hare Krishna, yeah? But for a Buddhist, reality is like an illusion. And you, you can't tell which bits of it are the illusion and, or not. You can't tell how far down the illusion goes. And this is actually a symptom of the realness of it, or as Buddhism would say, the suchness. Right? And, I, and, and I truly think there's some kind of stepping stone from, I've become this hallelujah, Honolulu guy, you know, for, for OOO. You know, and I truly think that you know, it's, it's actually underneath nihilism. It's not trying to push it and say nihilism is stupid. It's actually saying inside this abyss of reason that we've opened up, we're going to discover this exit from this catastrophe that this very abyss has also created, I believe, you know, because I'm Mr. Pollyanna. Yeah. Yeah, so Tim, uh, two things that maybe tie some of the strands together. First, I'm fine with objects, so that's not a problem. What about? Um, the first, uh, in terms of, I was interested in your response to uh, Jane or about what you're doing, and you yes. have to, this in terms of a homeopathic dose of anxiety. Yeah. And at least I've been writing for several years, and in fact, that's what our media has been doing since 9-11, is precisely, or, or has engaged us precisely in a kind of, uh, let's say, almost feedback loop in which we are made anxious by the media. And well, and then, I, uh, I, I would say that's allopathic fear. Because it's fear of some unspecified, unknown, unknown Donald Rumsfeld Muslim threat, right? That's that's real and outside of American that's values. Of it, that, that's part of it, but there are many ways we're made anxious, and I think the yeah. anxiety is then uh, the homeopathic part, the part that's going to make it better, is when we get to uh, reconnect with our media and our screen. So the anxiety is connected with a kind of disconnect. And oh, sure. There's ways of, there's ways of, you're, you're, you're just repeating Heidegger, you're saying that anxiety comes up and then we have to create this horrible reality to suffocate it, right? And so they're kind of code emergent, right? And um, that's all I'm saying, right? There's a kind of dialectical tension there. Okay, well, I guess you know? my concern is that, yeah, so it seems like part of what you're doing might be more like what, I mean, I guess I'm with Jane in terms of, like, I don't know if the anxiety uh, really is the best, or fear is the best way to go. I have another yeah, fear, fear is dangerous. I should have just talked about love. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> another more pragmatic question, uh, which, you know, I don't expect a pragmatic answer, but I'll ask anyone. Anyway. Oh. Um, and I ask it as a teacher and uh, mentor and advisor of graduate students. Yes. And so this is back to kind of, you know, what you, the performative nature right. of, of the talk, which, you know, is fantastic. Oh, thanks. I mean, I love this quite enjoyable, etc. But the question is, is it is it imminent? In other words, are, is this what you are teaching, for example? Am I, am I a normative? Is all this normative? Am I saying we should all jump around like Whether Skeeter? It, yeah, either normative or is this something that's transferable or that you want to, or is this something, I mean... Well, there's no meta-language, right? So whatever you do, you cannot peel yourself away from reality. I truly believe that now, and I think that ecological awareness is the Lacanian truth, that there is no meta-language, actually, right? Since there is no meta-language, my subject position, I'll translate this into Althusserian for you if it helps, my subject position is inevitably interwoven into the things that I construct. Since this is the case, I can't just go around trying to persuade people Right? I have to do other stuff, which, you know, is a little bit of magic. I have to magnetize, I have to enrich, I have to destroy, you know, that's a bit dangerous, you know, and, 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 so, and I have to pacify, I have to do these things, right? I, be, be, because it isn't just thinking, it's feeling, hoping. I mean, when you're at a conference, you realize, right, oh, I have fantastic intellectual, and then all of a sudden, the jealousy and the competition, oh, I'm mentioning stuff that shouldn't be said, right? But anyway, stuff comes up, right? Shit, come, not, not for us, but for other people who I've known who have gone to conferences, shit happens, right? In their, set, in their heads, right? And you can't dislocate that from the thinking. The thinking is made out of it, right? So if there's no matter language, then you do need to, we do need to be making things that are not just fantastic, 
the persuasive multi footnoted thing. But we do actually still have to. I believe in following the form. You know, I actually think that we can't just go into complete. You know, anything goes. It's quite good to follow the form because then you because you know then you then you get to like like it's like learning how to make rice pudding, right? First of all, you learn how to make proper rice pudding. It's the, 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 the food the Buddha ate that made him realize, oh my God, the physical world is great. Um, you know, I don't have to transcend it. And um, made this right, first of all, you have to learn how to make really perfect rice pudding. Then you, when you get really good at making rice pudding, you have to make it a little bit burnt, right? Because the slightly burnt rice pudding is more delicious, right? And so what my job is right now is to do a little bit of that, slightly evil, suspicious weirdness, you know, because I'm safe, because I got tenure. So I don't think, I think, <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I'm anxious to end, uh, since we've gotten a couple of steps beyond anxiety. So uh, <laughs> please come back at nine. We have uh, a plenary by uh, Wendy Chung. Mm. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming, and thank you very much. My pleasure.